creaking heavy door. Reg! he yelled. After a moment, another watchman appeared and saluted. He was grey-faced, and Clarence couldn't help noticing when the man saluted that the hand and fingers were held together with stitching. "'Have you met Constable Shoe, Clarence?' said Vimes cheerfully. "'One of my staff. Been dead for more than thirty years and loves every minute of it, eh, Reg?' "'Right, Mr Vimes,' said Reg, grinning and revealing a lot of brown teeth. "'Some fellow countryman of yours down in the cellar, Reg,' said Vimes. "'Oh, dear. Lurching, are they?' "'Fraid so, Reg.' "'I shall go and have a word with them,' said Reg. He saluted again and marched out with a hint of a lurch. "'Fellow countryman, he's uh, from here,' said Chinny, who had gone quite pale. "'Oh, no, no. The undiscovered country,' said Vimes. "'He's dead. However, credit where it's due, he hasn't let that stop him. "'You didn't know we have a zombie in the watch, Clarence?' "'Er, uh, no, sir, I haven't been back to the city in five years,' he swallowed. "'I gather things have changed.' "'Horribly so, in Clarence Chinney's opinion. "'Being consul to Slovenia had been an easy job, "'which left him a lot of time to get on with his business. And "'Then the big semaphore towers marched through "'all along the valley and suddenly Ankh Morpal was an hour away. "'Before the clacks, a letter from Ankh Morpal "'would take more than two weeks to get to him, "'and so no one worried if he took a day or two to answer it. Now people expect a reply overnight. He was quite glad when Boris Radio had destroyed several of those wretched towers. And then all hell had been let loose. We've got all sorts in the watch, said Vibes. And we bloody well need them now, Paris. With Slovenians and Boragravians scrapping in the streets over some damn quarrel that began a thousand years ago. It's worse than dwarfs and trolls. All because someone's great to the power of umpteen grandmother slapped the face of someone's great ditto uncle. Boragravia and Slovenia can't even agree on a ball duck. They chose the river and that changes course every spring. Suddenly the Clax Towers are now on Boragravian soil. Or mud, anyway. So the idiots burn them down for religious reasons. Uh, there is more to it than that, sir, said Chinny. Yes, I know. I read the history. The annual scrap with Slovenia is just a local derby. Boragravia fights everybody. Why? National pride, sir. What in? There's nothing there. There's some tallow mines and they're not bad farmers, but there's no great architecture, no big libraries, no famous composers, no very high mountains, no wonderful views. All you can say about the place is that it isn't anywhere else. What's so special about Boragravia? I suppose it's special because it's theirs. And, of course, there's Nuggan, sir, their god. I bought you a copy of the Book of Nuggan. I looked through one back in the city, Chinny, said Vimes. Seemed pretty stupid. That wouldn't have been our least condition, sir. And I suspect it wouldn't be our uh, very current that far from here. This one is more up to date, said Chinny, putting a small but thick book on the desk. Up to date? What do you mean up to date? Holy writ gets written. Do this, don't do that. No coveting your neighbour's ox. Um, Nuggan doesn't just leave it at that, sir. He, um, updates things. Mostly the abominations to be thanked. Vines took the new copy. It was noticeably thicker than the one he brought with him. It's what they call a living testament, he explained. They, well, I, I suppose you could say they die if they're taken out of borrowed graveyard. They no longer get added to. The latest abominations are, are at the end, sir, he said helpfully. This is a holy book with an appendix. Exactly, sir. In a ring binder? Quite so, sir. People put blank pages in and the abominations turn up. You mean magically? I suppose I mean religiously, sir. Vimes opened the page at random. Chocolate. He doesn't like chocolate. Yes, sir. That's an abomination. Garlic. Well, I don't much like it either, so fair enough. Cats. Oh, yes. He really doesn't like cats, sir. Dwarfs. It says here, the dwarfish race which worships gold are an abomination unto Nugget. He must be mad. What happened? 
Oh, the dwarfs that were here sealed their minds and vanished, your guess. I bet they did. They know trouble when they see it, said Vimes. He let your grace pass this time. Chinny clearly derived some satisfaction from talking to a duke. He leafed through the pages and stopped. The colour blue? Correct, sir. What's abominable about the colour blue? It's just a colour. The sky is blue. Yes, sir. Devout Nugganites try not to look at it these days. Um... Chinny had been trained as a diplomat. Some things he didn't like to say directly. Nuggan, sir, um, is rather... Tetchy, he managed. Tetchy, said Vines. A tetchy god. What? He complains about the noise their kids make? Objects to loud music after 9pm? Um, we get the Ankh-Morpork times here, sir, eventually. And, uh, I'd say, um, that Nuggan is very much like, um, the kind of people who write to its letter. You know, sir, the kind who sign their letters disgusted with Ankh Morpork. Oh, you mean he really is mad, said Vimes. Oh, I'd never mean anything like that, sir, said Chinny hurriedly. What do the priests do about this? Not a lot, sir. I think they quietly ignore some of the more, um, Abomination. You mean, Nuggan objects to the dwarfs, cats and colour blue, and there are more insane commandments? Chinny coughed politely. All right then. More extreme commandments. Oysters, sir. He doesn't like them. But that's not a problem, because no one there has ever seen an oyster. Oh, and babies. He abominated them too. I take it people still make them here. Oh, yes, your... Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. But they feel guilty about it. Barking dogs, that was another one. Shirts with six buttons, too. And cheese. Um, people just sort of, um, avoid the trickier ones. Even the priests seem to have given up trying to explain them. Yeah, I think I can see why. So, what we have here is a country that tries to run itself on the commandments of a god who the people feel may be wearing his underpants on his head. Has he abominated underpants? No, sir, Chin sighed. But it's probably only a matter of time. So, how do they manage? These days, people mostly pray to the Duchess Anagogia. You see icons of her in every house. They call her the Little Mother. Ah, yes, the Duchess. Can I get to see her? Oh. No one sees her, sir. No one except her servants has seen her for more than 30 years. To be honest, sir, she's probably dead. Only probably. No one really knows. The official story is that she's in mourning. It's rather sad, sir. The young duke died a week after he was married, gored by a wild pig during a hunt, I believe. She went into mourning at the old castle at Prince Marmaduke Piotr Albert Hans Josef Bernhard Wilhelmsberg and hasn't appeared in public since. The official portrait was painted when she was about 40, I believe. No children? No, sir. On her death, the line is extinct. And they pray to her like a god. Chinny sighed. I did put this in my briefing notes, sir. The royal family in Boragravia have always had a quasi-religious status, you see. They're the head of the church, and the peasants, at least, praise them in the hope that they'll put in a good word with Nugger. They're like living saints, celestial intermediaries. To be honest, that's how these countries work in any case. If you want something done, you have to know the right people. And I suppose it's easier to pray to some picture than to a god you can't see. Vimes sat looking at the console for some time. When he next spoke, he frightened the man with boots. Food in Herod. Sir? Just following the monarchy, Mr. Chinny. If the Duchess is on the throne, who should be? Um, it's incredibly complex, sir, because of the intermarriages and the various legal systems, which, for example, owes the smart money on, Mr. Chinny. Prince Heinrich of Slovenia. To Chile's astonishment, finds laughed. 
And he's wondering how hard he's getting on, I expect. I met him this morning, didn't I? Can't say I took to him. But he is a friend of Ank Morpork, said Chinny reproachfully. That was in my report. Educated, very interested in the clans, got great plans for his country. They used to be Luganatic in Slovenia, but he's banned the religion, and frankly, hardly anyone objected. He wants Slovenia to move forward. He admires Ank Morpork very much. Yes, I know. He sounds almost as insane as Nuggan, said Vimes. OK, so what we've probably got is an elaborate charade to keep Heinrich out. How's this place governed? There isn't much. A bit of tax collecting and that's about all. We think some of the senior court officials just drift on as if the Duchess is alive. The only thing that really works is the army. All right. How about coppers? Everyone needs coppers. At least they have their feet on the ground. I believe informal citizens' committees enforce nugganatic law, said Ginny. Oh, gods. Prod noses, curtain twitches and vigilantes, said Vines. He stood up and peered out of the narrow window at the plain below. It was night time. Cooking fires in the enemy camp made demonic constellations in the darkness. Did they tell you why I've been sent here, Clarence? Said, no, sir. My instructions were that you would um, oversee things. Prince Heinrich is not very happy about it. Oh, well, the interests of Hank Morpork are the interests of all money love. <laughs> Oops, sorry. All freedom loving people everywhere, said Vimes. We can't have a country that turns back our mail coaches and keeps cutting down the Clax Towers. That's expensive. They're cutting the continent in half. They're the pinch in the hourglass. I'm to bring things to a satisfactory conclusion. And frankly, Clarence, I'm wondering if it's even worth attacking Boragravia. It'll be cheaper to sit here and wait for it to explode. Although I notice... Where was that report? Oh, yeah. It will starve first. Uh, regrettably so, sir. Igor stood mutely in front of the recruiting table. Don't often see you people these days, said Jacko. Yeah, run out of fresh brains, have ya? said the corporal nastily. Now then, corporal, no call for that, said the sergeant, leaning back in his creaking chair. There's plenty of lads out there walking around on legs they wouldn't still have if there hadn't been a friendly Igor around. Eh, hey, Igor? Yeah? Well, I heard about people waking up and finding their friendly Igor had whipped out their brains in the middle of the night and bugging off to flog them, said the corporal, glaring at Igor. I promise you, your brain is entirely safe from me, Corporal, said Igor. Polly started to laugh and stopped when she realised that absolutely no one else was doing so. Yeah, well, I met a sergeant who said an Igor put a man's legs on backwards, said Corporal Strappy. What good's that to a soldier, eh? I could advance and retreat at the same time, said Igor levelly. Sergeant, I know all of stories and they are nothing but vile calumnies. I seek only to serve my country. I do not want trouble. Right, said the sergeant. Nor do we. Make your mark and you've got to promise not to mess about with Corporal Strappy's brain, right? Another signature? My word, I can see we've got ourselves a bleeding college of recruits today. Give him his cardboard shilling, Corporal. Thank you, said Eagle. And I would like to give the picture a wipe if it's all the same for you. He produced a small drop. Wipe it? said Strappy. Is that a lad, Sergeant? What do you want to wipe it for, mister? Jackson. To remove the invisible demon, monsieur, said he. I can't see any invis... Strappy began. And stopped. Just let him, all right, said Jackram. It's one of their funny little ways. Don't seem right muttered Strappy. Practically treason. Can't see why it would be wrong just to give the old girl a wash, said the sergeant shortly. Next. Oh. After carefully wiping the stained picture and giving it a perfunctory peck, Igor came and stood next to Polly, giving her a sheepish grin. But she was watching the next recruit. He was short and quite slim which was fairly usual in a country where it was rare to get enough food to make you fat. But he dressed in black and expensively, like an aristocrat. He even had a sword. The sergeant was, therefore, looking worried. 
Clearly, a man could get into trouble, talking wrong to a knob who might have important friends. You sure you come to the right place, sir? He said. Yes, Sergeant, I wish to enlist. Sergeant Jackram shifted uneasily. Yes, sir, but I'm sure a gentleman like you. Are you going to enlist me or not, Sergeant? Not usual for a gentleman to enlist as a common soldier, sir, mumbled the Sergeant. What you mean, Sergeant, is, is anyone after me? Is there a price on my head? And the answer is no. Abba a morning pitchfork, said Corporal Strappy. He's a bloody vampire, Sarge. Anyone can see that. He's a black ribboner. Look, he's got the badge. Which says not one drop, said the young man calmly. Not one drop of human blood, Sergeant. A prohibition I have accepted for almost two years, thanks to the League of Temperance. Of course, if you have a personal objection, Sergeant, you need only give it to me in writing. Which was quite a clever thing to say, Holly thought. Those clothes cost serious money. Most of the vampire families were highly knobby. You never knew who was connected to who. Not just to who, in fact, but to whom. Whom's were likely to be far more trouble than your common everyday who. Sergeant is looking down the line. Got to move with the times, Corporal, he said, deciding not to go there. And we certainly need the men. Yeah, but suppose he wants to suck all my blood out in the middle of the night, said Strappy. Well, he'll just have to wait until Private Eagle's finished looking for your brain, won't he? snapped the sergeant. Sign here, mister. The pen scratched on the paper. After a minute or two, the vampire turned the paper over and continued writing on the other side. But you can call me Maladict, he said, dropping the pen back in the inkwell. Thank you very much, I must say, sir. Private. Give him the shilling, Corporal. Good job it's not a silver one, eh? <laughs> yes, said Maladict. It is. Next, said the sergeant. Polly watched as a farm boy, breeches held up with string, shuffled in front of the table and looked at the quill pen with the resentful perplexity of those confronted with new technology. She turned back to the bar. The landlord glared at her in the manner of bad landlords everywhere. As her father always said, if you kept an inn, you either liked people or went mad. Oddly enough, some of the mad ones were the best at looking after their beer. But by the smell of the place, this wasn't one of those. She leaned on the bar. Wait, please, she said, and watched glumly as the man gave a scowl of acknowledgement and turned to the big barrels. It'll be sour, she knew, with the slop bucket under the tap tipped back in every night, and the spigots not tipped back, and yes, it was going to be served in a leather tanker that had probably never been washed. A couple of new recruits were already knocking back their pints, though, with every audible sign of enjoyment. But this was plume, after all. Anything that made you forget you were there was probably worth drinking. One of them said, Lovely pint, this eh? The boy next to him belched and said, Best I've tasted, yeah. Polly sniffed at the tank. The contents smelled like something she wouldn't feed to pigs. She took a sip and completely changed her opinion. She would feed it to pigs. Those lads have never tasted beer before, It's like Dad said. Out in the country there are lads who join up for an uninhabited pair of breeches. And they'll drink this muck and pretend to enjoy it like men. Hey, up we supped some stuff last night, eh, lads? And then next thing... Oh, Lord, that reminded her. What would the privy be like here? The men's one out in the yard back at home was bad enough. Polly sloshed two big pails of water into it every morning while trying not to breathe. There was weird green moss growing on the slate floor, and the Duchess was a good eater. It had customers who took their boots off before going to bed.